My name is Andrew Dorwart. I'm business manager for uh, the UK Repository Net Plus project, otherwise known as RecNet. Um, we've been running this project for uh, almost a year now. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're, it's very interesting to hear Yvonne being so bullish about uh, institutional repositories and their potential central place in the whole open access marketplace because that's what we're, we're about to represent is we're building a very strong, sustainable set of services which will be used by our <coughs> IR managers precisely to do that, to put IR managers right in the centre center of that picture with regard to open access, with regard to the ref, with regard to everything that's going to be coming down the line in the next next year or so. Now the way we're going to um, structure this is I'll give you an update on where we are with the project. I, I talked to uh, your members group when I first started the job uh, back last January in Portsmouth. Obviously things have changed an awful lot since then but I'll give you uh, a bit of background to the project, what we've done, uh, but what we really want to concentrate on here is what we're planning to do, the new functionality, the new services that are going to be added in over the course of the next um, seven, eight months of our, of our project. And this is this is like gold dust to us. We've, we started formulating these ideas for new services during OR12. We had a, a very good OR12. We had uh, four workshops which were immensely helpful in helping to to form our ideas about gap analysis of new things that are required. So we've done a fair amount of work on that and what we're, to, what we're going to do here is I will give you an overview of what of what that thinking has been and then I'll hand over to my, my colleague, colleague Pablo and Pablo will go through some specific use cases associated with that new functionality. So you can get, get an idea of the kinds of things that we're planning. Now I should emphasize that None of this is any policy weight. This is what we're doing at the minute is we're gathering evidence for a meeting of the GISC oversight group which happens on the 29th of November. So your input from this meeting here and also from the survey that uh, Dominic sent out on my behalf uh, three days ago and thank you to everybody who's responded to that survey so far. It's really, really good stuff. But if I could encourage you to take part in the survey monkey to just to go through the questions that we've been asking, because the answers to these questions really help to, to form ideas about uh, what, we're actually, what we're actually going to build. So we'll do a brief presentation, and then we'd like to have a 10, we're, we're actually talking for an hour and 10 minutes, but we're not going to be talking all that time. We'll, we'd like to have 10, 15 minutes at the end where uh, we can invite comment and, and feedback from, from you on what, what's valuable and uh, what may be less valuable. A lot of you will be familiar with this picture. We drew this picture about a year ago. Um, and what's happened in the course of our project? Well, lots and lots of things have changed. Obviously, external to our project, as Yvonne said, there's lots of, lots of stuff that's been happening in the repository landscape. But we found that this picture that we drew of the whole supply chain for publishing, taking in the funders, uh, the researchers, the authors, uh, the publishers, and of course, the HEI the, the institutions, has stayed remarkably valid for that year. What we've been doing is we've been validating that landscape, trying to update it, but actually it's not really needed, a, needed an awful lot of update. So it's a, it looks a very complicated picture, but in fact it's fairly straightforward that you have the funder, you have, you have Jerry's people who will fund the researchers, who will then de either deposit into a subject repository, uh, such as um, uh, the UK PMC, an institutional repository, uh, it'll be published and it will then go through the through the cycle to being made available through subscriptions through the library of the higher educational institute and then the blog in the centre here this is to do with the discovery of how of how readers actually discover the information so using common search tools like Google uh, less well used ones such as Oyster to be able to uh, interrogate subjects um, subjects and institutional repositories to find out what's out, out there and what is open and what can actually be used. So it's a very robust picture, which we we kind of simplified because we need to think about what our focus is for this project. So this kind of um, becomes simplified into kind of two, two, two different halves really. So up at the top right hand is open access, which is really what our project is all about. 
But what we've been finding, and this is it's quite interesting to see to hear Yvonne saying basically exactly the same thing, that um, we're more and more butting across into research information management because we found quite quickly, around about February, March, we found that um, we needed to be cognizant of crises because we're, the, the, the landscape is very fragmented. That you have, you have some crises that are being used as repositories, you have some repositories that are, that are being used as crises. So it's not a, it's not a simple, it's not a, 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 a simple landscape as we originally thought. So we've been finding that we've been doing more and more work, kind of slightly outside of our scope in the research information management field, and just have actually been been very helpful in inviting us to workshops with the RIM strand so that we their thinking can inform what we are doing in terms of, in terms of the project. I use this as a, as a good way of illustrating uh, the context for a project, the scope of the project and the focus. 98% of our time uh, we're spending on, on the focus, but we have to be cognizant of of the overall context. The context is stuff that um, uh, affects our project but we have absolutely no influence on. So things like government policy, the Finch report, funder mandates that are coming through, uh, publisher practices, all that stuff kind of happens outside. So we can work with people like RSP and UK Corp to, to lobby but we have to, we have to think of these as influences that are coming in. In terms of the broad scope, um, what we've done because we also got very interested in uh, gold open access. As soon as the Finch report was, was published, we suddenly realized that when the project started, it had been all about green open access, and it had been all about IRs. Finch changed an awful lot of that, or it changed a lot of our thinking. So we realized that we had to become <coughs> color neutral with regard to open access publishing, that uh, green and gold for us, it's exactly the same. And luckily, the tools and the services that we've been developing actually are <coughs> color, color neutral, that we actually can use different uh, tools that we've got to serve as gold open access as well as green open access. But we did start to get interested in this idea of payment and we, Pablo and uh, Peter Burnhill, our director, and I put together a paper, a pedestrian view of roads to open access, which is really looking at meta, a possible, very high level view of metadata flows through the open access payment method. We've got it articles up on our website and we did that really to to try to focus on ideas on how this could work, influence other people in their thinking on how it could work uh, because we, we realized that a lot of the tools and services that we're developing could potentially be, be broadened out to be quite useful as part of this process of having the payment process happening within the academy rather than potentially with a, a third party commercial developers or set of developers are it being handled, handled by publishers. Uh, as I say, we are, in terms of scope, we also had a very good um, uh, OR12 with Open Air. We had uh, one big workshop with the technical guys from Open Air, and there's a lot of interest from uh, the EC funded prospect projects in using tools like um, uh, Ross's Iris tool, our RJ broker that we use for distributing. Articles, articles through the network uh, into using the, road, the existing Romeo and Juliet services. So that was that was very helpful getting that contact established, and that's going to be something that's ongoing. In terms of our day-to-day -day work, what we actually do at the moment, we're we're rolling out um, the Wave One business proposals. If we, it will become clearer what these what these business proposals are as I go through go through the slides. And what we're doing is we're creating a, a solid infrastructure for RecNet around things like service desks, uh, hosting, a service portfolio, a service catalogue that will help to support the sustainability of these, of these services going forward. And we're also working with our partners uh, at uh, Mimus, at Adina, uh, at, uh, at, at, at UCOM, at Nottingham, to start to put together kind of data, this, what just call a data-driven infrastructure so that these services are informing each other so that the data are, is resurfacing in different areas throughout the system. So that rather than having lots of silo-based services, you begin to get services that are actually inform, informing each other. So we, we spend a lot of time on this. And what that's helped us with is the gap analysis. And that's really the subject of what we want to talk about today, because that gap analysis is 
beginning to tell us what additional applications we actually need on top of what we are already building and which will be rolled out, uh, rolled out next March. And that's really what we want to talk to you today about. So a brief history lesson. Um, what we originally submitted to JISC for the Wave 1 was a whole kind of hodgepodge of di different services, which I won't go through in detail, but if you concentrate on A, B, C, D, and D, this is the way that we we'll use to try and make sense of this. So the different functional areas of aggregation, text mining and search, benchmarking, statistics, reporting, uh, creating relevant registries, uh, deposit tools, and enhancing metadata quality. There were different bids that came in from uh, different universities were providing services around these, and these were considered by the JISC OSG group way back in January. And what came out of that, the decisions on that, was that our Wave 1 components, relative, there are relatively few of them, but they're actually very strong, because what they allow us to do is, crucially, to start to report, and Ross is going to tell you more about the IRIS service and how that actually works, but also to deposit. So using Romeo and Juliet as databases to inform uh, funder policies and publisher po policies, and also to start to use these policies to uh, automatically ingest articles into uh, IRs using a tool called the RJ Broker that we've, that we've developed at Dean up in Edinburgh. And what we're doing at the moment is we're working with uh, one one publisher, Nature Publishing Group, uh, one um, uh, subject repository, which is UK, UK PMC, so quite strong kind of biomedical side, and potentially also working with uh, with NORA, with the NERC data center. So uh, we're getting, we're, we've got tests on going with the broker at the moment to, to actually bring that into service. So on te aggregation text mining and search, the different services that were put forward got to kind of part in the innovation zone and uh, are, are subject to a piece of consultancy that we've, uh, we've, uh, we've uh, commissioned. In terms of enhancing metadata quality, that's felt to be absolutely crucial. And Names2 is an, obviously an existing service that, that we could use. And the feeling from just was that that should be aligned with ORCID and should work in some joint up with ORCID, which is which is happening at the moment. In terms of relevant registries, so creating a, a, a registry of repositories, uh, at the moment the broker is harvesting from both Open Door and Roar as existing services, and that will be ongoing. But uh, we put out uh, an invitation to tender, which uh, we just got the bids back for just kind of evaluating that at the moment. So we will be creating a new registry that will that will feed that will feed the broker. I don't know who it's going to be yet, but uh, the bids are already in for that. So that kind of brings us through to the overview of wave one. So you can see what I mean about the kind of um, silo type of effect that uh, we have IRS UK for the reporting, we have the different deposit tools which are Romeo and Juliet and the broker. Uh, we have the existing names project for metadata quality, and we've got the existing registries which are which are feeding into it, into the broker. So a snapshot of uh, where we are in autumn 2012 is that on aggregation and search, we commissioned a report from KPL from Jeremy and Brown uh, to look at all of the different search tools that are out there at the moment, uh, how well they're they're indexed and intact, and to give us some recommendations of a good way forward so that we can make the common tools such as Google Search much more um, uh, useful and, and more comprehensive in, in finding content in repositories than they, are, than they are at the moment. So that's at the moment in its third iteration. We've given our recommendations back on that. But what we hope will come out of that is that uh, we'll have the opportunity to create a, a new aggregation of metadata which will inform us with lots of things to do with reporting <coughs> and with search. As I say, we're building this kind of infrastructure around, um, around RevNet, which is the, the service desk and is the service catalogue. We're working with uh, uh, UCOM, with the Innovation Zone, to build that, uh, that catalogue up. At the moment, it's, uh, it started off as an Excel spreadsheet. It's now become uh, a prototype web service, so that will become 
much more open and it'll be much easier to use and see what potential services are there, their state of readiness, an API into the data so that develop, developers can start to get their, their hands on these ideas, we can start to, to body them out a little bit. We've got the tender out for the registry of repository, so that kind of take, will potentially take care of, uh, of that gap. So we're beginning to kind of close the gaps up at, at the moment. Now, this looks a complicated slide, it's actually very simple, because what we're doing is we're, <coughs> we're concentrating on services. But when RetNet goes live, it's absolutely essential that it's seen by the community as being utterly robust. It's going to be something that is sustainable, it's going to be something that's going to be around for the next five, five to ten years, because we'll, we will be, we'll be expecting to be storing valuable data, valuable links between different pieces of data, and obviously nobody's going to rely on a service that's continually reliant on year-on-year -year funding from the just for it to keep on going. So we've bit, we, we use a language called ITIL, which is it's very useful for communicating with the GIST and also communi communi communicating with their service providers because it gives us a, a means of describing what it is that we're doing. So overall, we have the, the repository net service portfolio. And going from left to right down here, you can see how service concepts start coming into, in, into the system. So we do a lot of market research. So this is part of our market research. What we did at OR12 was part of our market research, our surveys that we put out as part of the market research. We work with innovation zones, so the tools that are in there at the moment, like the Rep UK, the Core, and the IRS search system, uh, we, we coordinate quite closely with Paul Walker and the team at, uh, at Innovation Zone and how these can be used going forward to start to come, in, come into service design. So where we're at at the moment is working with uh, the guys at Nottingham and Romeo and Juliet, uh, working with Ross and his team at Iris UK to start to develop develop these projects as service and at a certain stage they then move across into service transition and then become operational services. So the only operational services we have at the moment are Romeo and Juliet, currently still hosted by, by uh, Nottingham University. We don't have any third party components in there but there are plans to, to bring some in as part of the service catalogue. And the idea is that as services become operational and are used, they may be retired and replaced by other ideas that are coming through the service design. So it's just a, it's a, it's a very simple way of thinking about prototyping and development and rollout in terms of a, of a service and infrastructure. So that brings me to the review of the post of the functionality of the post wave one services. So where we are at the moment, all of the uh, items are blue in blue are stuff that what we call the wave one components that we're working to bring from project to service. And that's all going very well. It's all, work, it's, all, it's all going to schedule. But we have to start thinking about the gaps that you can see in here. So one thing that we'd like to do is we'd like to extend out the benchmarking and reporting. So uh, as you'll hear, Iris at the moment is producing uh, stats and downloads, very good kind of compliance stats and download. But we'd like to move this out a little bit more to start doing project reporting, so being able to uh, report on um, individual funder projects, project IDs, the research outputs that are associated with the project IDs, so that we can start to create some kind of dashboard for monitoring the, the investment that uh, AGIs are, are putting into, into open access and how that's actually being, being used. We're also interested in starting to benchmark our IR network in some way against um, against the publisher network. And Pavel will take you through the particular use case for doing that with one single publisher. We're also very aware that um, when Iris goes live and we start to get the results coming through, it's quite possible that we might find that there are gaps sitting in our metadata. So we need to find ways of uh, getting very good metadata enhancements. So we've got several, they're not, they're not services, they're more what I would call supporting activities. So for example, we plan to be working with, uh, with FundRef to start to get some funder information coming into the 
set of metadata fields which can then be populated into uh, into IR into the IR network. Like, likewise, working with Crossref to start to get more DOIs coming in, so that um, we're beginning to enrich our metadata content across the IR network. Likewise, what I was talking about the fragmented landscape between Chris's and IRs, uh, we would like to see more endpoint, sword endpoints being implemented by people like Symplectic and Atira and uh, the big the, the big Chris providers, because until until then endpoints are there in these systems, uh, our broker has to deal with them differently, has to deal with the Chris system differently from what to deal the way that we deal with uh, with an IR. So we're wanting to kind of level the landscape a little bit with that. And Pablo has been uh, quite instrumental in lobbying with um, the, the big Chris software providers to try to bring the provision of sword endpoints higher up their, on their, their development schedule than it is at the moment. Uh, likewise, on, on names and an authority file for names, um, again, Pablo's been working with, uh, with the guys at uh, Orchid, uh, I'm liaison with Amanda Hill about names to, to, to try to start to encourage the uptake of uh, Orchid in the UK so that we can start to move towards a, a very good, uh, author good, good authority files for, for, for researchers in the UK. That's obviously going to be a fairly slow process, but it's one of the things that we see as being one of our, our supporting activities. Likewise, uh, the REOX project, when uh, the guidelines are published and the, um, the app is available, we're going to start to see the kind of gold dust that we need in terms of the, that funder data, like everything that's in the, in the REOX extension relating to, to funding information ought to be able to be implemented and to be used within the, within the IR network. So coordinating that together we see as, as being one of our, our main activities. Likewise, the, trying, to, trying to level this playing field between the IRs and the Chris's through, through some kind of Serif OEI PMH mapping or, or even better, serifying data in the way that uh, Glasgow University are doing at the moment with their um, with the with the reprint system, trying to replicate that maybe for for D space, so that you're beginning to get uh, a serif information flow coming through the through the IR environment. That's something that uh, that we're working with just to try to encourage. So these are the these are the supporting activities. Then we also have to consider third party components for uh, the RepNet service catalog. And we've been looking at the area of curation. And preservation. We took part in a workshop at uh, UCOM uh, just in the middle of October, and we, from that, we identified uh, one service which is basically using it's to, uh, it's, it's the e it's based on the ePrints Keep It service, which is utilising Jove and Droid to identify data formats for uh, to, for deposits within institutions, and that's already being run as a service through ePrints. It'd be nice if that was also moved across to. Uh, to the to the D space network because that was one of the one of the curation areas we identified as being potentially quite an important one. Likewise, some kind of tool for doing a PDF to XML conversion, whether it's Robit. There's, there's there's several services that are not services, pieces of software that are out there at the moment that do the job for uh, to some extent or other, and that's something we'd like to make available to you. Uh, through, through our service catalog, which would then help with the, with the text mining, the data, and the metadata enhancement. We also have an idea for potential new services, and that a lot of that came out of the of Sheridan's report and search that we see aggregation middleware as being potentially very, very important for doing a couple of things. First of all, for building out this notion of the funder dashboard, so that you can do faceted search on project IDs on individual funders, and you can see the related research outputs in terms of research articles, and from research articles as a window into, into the whole area of research data management. And we, middleware would be an excellent way to start to build up this concept of the dashboard. Likewise for uh, search, for search indexing, having an aggregation that can be used specifically to 
start to tag metadata in a way that's going to be useful so it can be picked up by the Google spiders and by Microsoft Academic Search. I think that is something that would also be quite an important central service that, that could be provided through an aggregation. So, as I say, none of this is set in stone. It's all, all subject to validation by, by the GIST on the 29th of November. But this is some of our initial thinking on the way forward. Likewise, in terms of potential applications onto components, this is what, what I mean by the data-driven infrastructure. There's a couple of ideas that we have, or actually it didn't come from us, it came from our, the, um, the studies that we did at OR12 with, our, uh, with the workshops that we have there. But uh, to have some kind of deposit monitor so we can start to monitor the rate of deposit into, into IRs because like, like of one, I think we, we, I think we all think that uh, eventually there's going to be a tipping point that's going to be reached through a combination of funder policies, uh, publisher policies, um, user behavior, uh, publisher behavior changing to where actually there will be a big deluge coming of new deposits coming into the IR network uh, from publishers, from subject repositories, possibly from data repositories. So a means of, of monitoring that and specifically monitoring uh, what, which deposits have come through the RJ broker. So what are automated deposits which are, if you like, coming through the RedNet network or the network of services that we provide and which are, which are manually provided. I think that would be quite a useful tool as much as much as part of our evaluation as anything else, but they certainly show the value of our services. Likewise, we had a, an idea for furthering, further automating the deposit process because what our broker tool does is it will, from, a, from an article, it will identify the, inst the correct institution and the correct IR, uh, and it will then go through the sort endpoints and, if you like, put it at the, the door of the repository manager to then to then ingest, to, to take their own decision to ingest it. But what we'd like to do is to further automate this and make it rules-based. So using the information that we've got within the Romeo and Juliet databases to make that machine, machine readable and machine executable. So we can create a rules engine that will work with the broker to look at uh, publisher policies for individual journals and hence articles, look at funder policies and send these articles to the right IR or the right subject repository according to what, what policy is and what it's allowed. So that's one of the, the kind of big ideas that we've got up there. And Pablo, Pablo will give some more detailed use cases for how we actually see this work and the, and the, the benefits of doing that. So this has been a, it's been a very quick zoom through because I wanted to keep this bit fairly short. Uh, I'm going to ask Pablo now to present some of the use cases around these new ideas for potential new applications. So, and we'll, then after that, we'll listen to what you say. And if, if you think this makes sense, then great. If it, if it doesn't make sense, if there's, or if there's, if, if there's stuff that we're missing, or, or, or you know, stuff that may, uh, that maybe we're, we're getting, but could be further refined, then, then please let us know either, either in the room or, or through, or through the survey, because as I say, this is, this is what informs us, and this is what helps to inform what we're asking for going forward for the next seven months, which are going to be 